So my name's David Ridley. I'm a lecturer in the, in the School of Humanities. I'm also a, a graduate teaching assistant and I'm doing a PhD in sociology in the University of Birmingham. Um, the title of my talk is The Uses of Flipping. I want to just start by uh, talking about the Luddites quickly. So the Luddites are... <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm just, I want to give you a different idea of the Luddites. So the Luddites are, are traditionally thought of as technophobes. Hello. Hello. Okay. I just move a lot. That's the reason. <laughs> okay. So the Luddites, uh, traditionally thought of as uh, archetypal technophobes. Uh, <coughs> however, um, you know, historical research has kind of revisited the Luddites, and uh, it's been concluded that. Uh, actually, they wanted factory technology, so they weren't anti-factory or anti-you know uh, mass production techniques. But it was the way that they were being implemented, and the the fundamental fact that they weren't involved in the decisions about how that technology would be imp implemented um, and in what way uh, that it would be used. So they weren't really technophobes; they were just defending their professionalism or defending their right to have a say in how technology was being implemented. I want to come back to this at the end, but it's something to think about as I go on. Um, my argument is that technologies aren't neutral. Um, they're always used for some particular purpose uh, or to solve some particular problem. This kind of argument I get from John Dewey. I haven't got time to talk about Dewey, but he's very interesting on this kind of thing, um, but not very popular in theory. Um, but anyway. My aim is to kind of talk about a couple of uses that flipping uh, is or can be put to. Uh, some of these things you might be familiar with or some of these things might be happening in the future, possibly. Um, and I want to open up some kind of problems with these uses. Um, but basically, you know, my aim here is to uh, just to open up questions about flipping. I, I'm not saying that flipping is necessarily bad, um, sure. although I'm going to say some critical things about it. but you know, we need to be aware of, of what it's being used for, and that's not always in our control. Um, so, yes, it's not necessarily also that good for teaching, which is something I'm going to talk about. So the first use of flipping uh, is as a time or labour-saving tool for academics. This is quite often how it's sold to us, and it's going to help us. <coughs> I just want to talk about the kind of uh, the original book on flipping. Um, you know, this kind of technology has been around for a while, but uh, arguably the book that made it famous is by Bergman and Sands called Flip Your Classroom, 2012. Um, you might not know this about flipping, but the kind of original authors came up with two versions of it. The first one I'm calling ordinary flipping. I had some other names for it, but they didn't translate it across all kind of you know cultural contexts. Um, but it's basically that idea that you replace lectures with videos um, and you know you use the class time for more participatory teaching, questions and answers or discussion, etc. But essentially the point is the use of flipping is primarily as a time saving tool for us. Then they, I'll talk about why, but they came up with a, another version called which they call flip mastery, which is much more to do with personalization. The kind of it's similar to kind of things that Brian was talking about that uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg are, are looking into at the moment about mobilising technology to give an individual learning experience and all this sort of stuff. I haven't got time to talk about that though. Um, but it's very complex. It's actually a lot of work. It doesn't really save any time. Uh, and the focus isn't technology or time saving. It's actually a lot more work. And so it's flipping most of the time. Um, but what's interesting about this book is that they realise that flipping doesn't work in terms of learning. So um, they, they saw that the test scores improved, but when in a conversational setting, when uh, teachers actually talked about the things that they were teaching with the students, the students couldn't really explain uh, the key concepts. Um, and the quote, they just learned for the test instead of really learning the essential concepts. Um, nevertheless, you know, this kind of flipping is very popular. Um, is a kind of very basic idea that's sold to academics. 
and this is another quote from Bergman and Sam that kind of sums it up. They say this is reproducible, scalable, customizable, and easy for teachers to wrap their minds around because teachers are obviously incredibly stupid. It needs to be very simple. Um, so Bergman and Sam's, although admitting that it didn't work, are happy to kind of ride this wave of popularity. And it's huge, you know, there's whole networks devoted to this, uh, which they're involved in. Um, in terms of why ordinary flipping doesn't work, uh, if you look at the kind of higher education best practice theories of teaching and learning that a lot of our professional, professionally accredited, accredited teaching courses are based on, some references there if you want to look at it, um, Basically, they distinguish between uh, approaches to teaching that promote particular approaches to learning on behalf of students, uh, surface versus deep. Surface approaches, uh, the kind of approaches encouraged by this idea of flipping. Um, you know, basically, videos just replace lectures. It's just another form of what they would call transmission, i.e. knowledge in the teacher's mind or in books or wherever it is, deposit in your brain, uh, job done. Um, but it's very much focused on goal completion, you know, task completion, instrumental, uh, you want to use another word for that. It's described as disastrous because students don't understand what they're learning. In most cases, they forget the important content uh, after this goal has been achieved. So basically, you get your degree and you can't remember what you learned on your degree anyway. Um, also, emotionally, it results, or should I say, in terms of student experience, it results in feelings of resentment, depression and anxiety. Deep approaches, on the other hand, are all about producing a change in worldview, you know, the, an entire new way of looking at the world. That's what you're supposed to get from university or all education. Um, you do this by challenging and involving students. Basically, participation is the key, and not just you know questions and answers, but in the whole process of, of learning and the choice of everything, you know, content, etc. This gives rise to feelings of pleasure, personal fulfilment, and a sense of achievement. So basically, the reason why ordinary flipping doesn't work is because it reproduces some of those problems with transmission approaches to teaching anyway. So basically, the conclusion is, if you're doing ordinary flipping, then it's not that good for learning. <coughs> Second use for flipping, these two can be used in conjunction, as a money-saving tool for universities. Um, the context for this is what you could call the structural transformation of higher education in the UK. So uh, these can, this can be summarised in two concepts, privatisation and marketisation. Privatisation is, has already happened, this is where you replace the government teaching grants. So the government used to pay for teaching um, and that came from taxpayer money. This has been replaced by student fees, so student pays universities directly, although there is taxpayer backing there. Uh, but it's privatising the income of universities. And then marketisation is kind of what's happening now, this is the current phase, where you're trying to introduce new providers into the sector. New providers means mostly for profit uh, kind of projects, universities, colleges, Pearson, whatever it might be. Um, the government want to do this because they believe in the principle of competition, improving everything, um, and it will drive up quality and give students more choice although it's a choice between less choice. <coughs> anyway, um, the, the result is, in terms of, of this talk, the, the point is that it results in universities being pushed towards finding efficiency. So to survive in this new world, you need to be more efficient, uh, reduce costs, increase income. Uh, and at the moment, because mostly we're still semi-public institutions, charities, this is just surplus. So the idea is you need to generate as much surplus as possible uh, and invest a lot of that in fixed assets or buildings or whatever it is to kind of secure some of your future, an you know, insecure future. Um, anyway, but it's hard to do this with universities. They are very expensive, you know, and actually there's the money and the, the in, you know, the out and the ins don't really balance that well. So you can uh, engage in short-term solutions like freezing pay rises, um, increasing workloads, you know, micromanaging staff just to kind of eke that, that extra bit out of them, us. Um, or in the long term, you could, you could do something a little bit more radical. You could create a two-tier structure uh, of, of academic staff or, or actually academics and other 
staff. Um, and what you do is you shrink the, the number of professional academics that cost a lot of money um, and you give them less teaching and then they can concentrate on getting money from grants, which is another form of, important form of income. And, and then you can have a, the rest of the, the kind of work of universities done by what you could call <coughs> tutors or even maybe in the future, uh, I don't know, facilitators or whatever, euphemism. Um, but the point is that flipping can do this because uh, it could be used as a management technology, if you like, a bit like the assembly line was, was used in, in Fordism, Taylorism. Um, this is why the, the Luddites are quite important. So, you know, small amount of academics make videos, basically produce the content, uh, then get on with other stuff, and then this content is delivered in whatever way, online or, you know, in a bit of class time, whatever, by deprofessionalised, uh, lower paid, you know, tutors on worse conditions, cheaper, basically. Um, a little bit like kind of Costa Coffee. Yeah, so baristas are kind of minimally trained. They deliver coffee. They're called baristas, but basically they're just service workers. Okay, so that's what could happen. Um, so this is one use of flipping, kind of structural, institutional use. However, this might not be a good idea. I don't know whether anyone's planning to do this in universities, but this is just one thing that could happen. However, in 2015, the government released a green paper on higher education, which is a kind of consultative document where it proposed lots of radical and scary things. We're not sure what they're going to do with those things yet. But they raised this concern with quality. Okay, so it seems like the government are worried that students aren't really learning anything at university or that we're not doing our job properly or whatever reason. But the issue of quality is raised. And one of the, one of the worries is that the, there is a lack of parity of status between research and teaching careers. So basically universities aren't focusing on teaching enough, according to the government. It's a quote. Um, but they also admit that, te that learning won't happen without focus, time, challenge and change. Um, so, I mean, the government have to look after higher education in a different way to universities. They need to make sure that the economy is looked after. They need to make sure that graduates have skills that the economy needs. Uh, the, the government have identified skill shortages in key areas like data analytics and big data. Um, but also they need to make sure that higher education is, is a valuable export. They need to defend the quality of our national education system while they're destroying it. <coughs> Sorry, that was a slip. Um, arguably this is a self-created problem through privatisation and marketisation. You can look, we can always look at the, at the US uh, in terms of the results of these things if we carry on. There's a book called uh, Academically Adrift where this team of researchers look at what students actually learn um, and you know in the US you've got 30, 40 years of kind of market, like marketisation of higher education, privatisation. But anyway, basically 45% of students demonstrate no significant improvement in a range of skills including critical thinking, uh, complex reasoning and writing the kind of basic transferable skills you're supposed to learn from higher education. Um, and they say this is because uh, of an institutional culture that, that puts undergraduate learning pretty much at the bottom of the priority list, below marketing, uh, you know, building nice buildings, whatever other thing that you use your money for. So in a sense, if ordinary flipping is used as a management tool, this will be in direct, direct contradiction with uh, the kind of government critique of higher education, which isn't necessarily a problem. I mean, it could be. But it will be a problem if the government carry on with the teaching excellence framework, where basically the government have a disciplinary uh, kind of monitoring system where they can say to universities, you're not doing your job properly, we're not going to validate your, uh, you know, your loan giving uh, ability, if you know what I mean. That's a complex point, but... Basically, um, they will be in contradiction. It's not going to be a good thing. And you know, generally having this two-tier rationalisation of the workforce would exacerbate this problem of uh, in uneven treating of research and, uh, and teaching in the university. This is a good thing for us because it opens up the question of quality. And my argument is that we know what quality is uh, and we are the best people to talk to, i.e. teachers, people involved in delivery learning the people that aren't actually being talked about, talked to about this. 
So it gives us an opportunity to kind of defend our professionalism, in effect. Um, we need to put forward good arguments about why we know what quality teaching is um, and not be drawn towards easy solutions. I'll come back to that. Like technology. Uh, if technology is used you know, to enhance our professionalism and enhance learning, then good. Um, but basically also, to, you know, this whole thing about flipping, you can use it to open up the whole question of privatisation and marketisation, um, which also we're not really involved in. So it's not just negative. Um, I think this should be number three. I forgot to change that to three. But also, you know, I want to say that there's flipping isn't necessarily bad. Like I said, it's not bad in, its, in itself. What's good about flipping is it encourages academics to focus on what you could call small group teaching. Um, and this is the best kind of teaching, in my opinion, but also according to best practice theorists again. Um, you know, we're talking kind of seminars, uh, you know, tutorials, etc. Um, this encourages a deep approach. It's challenging, exciting. Students really like it. You know, the, the people that do this well have excellent relationships with their students. Um, it's very difficult. However, you know, the problem is that a lot of this teaching is done by casualised uh, precarious staff. So my point here is that the structural kind of stuff is really important and you know is going to affect what you do with technology and well-meaning applications of technology will be affected by these things. I won't go into this. Um, so basically the best kind of teaching is undermined by things outside of flipping. Uh, you know excessive workloads, casualisation, excessive class sizes, um, you know, solutions that have negative effects. Um, multi this kind of stuff requires massive investment in, in professional uh, recognition, you know, employing more teachers, reducing class sizes, etc. Um, my argument would be that we should get rid of, I'll rephrase it, get rid of lectures altogether. I don't think we need lectures in, the, in most cases. Um, I can't have time to talk about this, but this is something I've been exploring in experiments with teaching and also making arguments based on the work of John Dewey and Jacques Rancière. If you're interested in this, <laughs> sorry to advertise something else I'm doing, I'm organising a conference with a colleague uh, on Jacques Rancière and critical pedagogy on May the 20th. I'll be talking about uh, that stuff, the positive stuff more. Uh, anyway, in conclusion, uh, I'd say we should remember the Luddites more positively than we have them. Um, we need to put people before machines. Um, basically, we need to be involved in discussions about the ends of technology. Technologies are a means to ends, but the ends are pre-decided most of the time. So if the end is profit, then it will be all about delivering products in the cheapest, most profitable way. Um, if it's about education, then we need to solve difficult things uh, and be involved in that process. My references. Thank you. If anyone wants to talk about this further, either come to this conference or you can email me. Thank you very much. <laughs>